الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. So the Battle of Qadisia, معركة القادسية, one of the most historic battles in the history of Islam, in the history of Faras, in the history of Persia, and as many of the ulama of tarikh have written, one of the most historic battles in the history of the world. Why? Because not only was it a great victory, and the way that Islam spread to the bulk of where Islam is today. For example, if we look at a large portion of the Muslim Ummah, it is passed in the, from Arabia past Persia. And if you look at Islam in Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, China, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, that whole Azerbaijan, that whole area, it had to go through Persia. And Persia was a block for Islam. Because the Persian Empire, they were fighting Islam. They wanted to stop Islam. They wanted to eliminate Islam. They wanted to finish Islam. They used to worship fire. And that's what they wanted to continue to worship. And they wanted to stop the call towards Tawheed. So this battle was very historic for Islam to spread to where now you will find a large amount of the Muslim Ummah. It's also very historic for the Persians because it ended that Persian Empire. <laughs> and it was the end, the last straw that broke that empire's back. And historically, when we talk about the numbers in the battle, you will see it's an amazing battle. Tell you, when we talk about the battle, and I looked at different historic documentation, Muslim and non-Muslim, from the historic records that the Persians have preserved for themselves, that the fire worshippers from their side were right. And from the records that have been preserved in the Qutb of Islamic Tariq, يعني تاريخ التبري ابن سعد يعني بداية والنهاب ابن كثير and other كتب uh, of Islamic uh, history and the work of Orientalists who were non-Muslims that wrote about those historic events and general books of history themselves looking at all of those the only records that are preserved with the checking of Asanid يعني one is just somebody says okay in a history book it said this but one is that we check who was there at the battle and who did they tell about what happened and who did they tell, when was it written, where is the chain that connects our Islamic record which tell you the most accurate is from the books of Islamic tarikh but I will mention what others wrote as well in an attempt to be fair insha'Allah ta'ala when we look at the battle we look at the Persians who had said they had sent originally a, an army of 100,000 joined by another 40,000 <coughs> and another 100,000 that were taken as draft. Yani they were obligated to fight. They weren't regular soldiers, but they were taken as people in a draft. So the army was 240,000. Rustam at the head of 240,000 Persian fighters. These are fighters. What we found in the kutub that were written by the Persians is that 80,000 more people went to serve the army subhanallah many of, again if you go to like Wikipedia or if you go to these places you will not find this documentation because they take a very yani, uh, uh, very uh, how would you, shallow look at it they find some book and they just type it up and then they're like okay but if you go into the kutub to research you will find even the Persians said that 80,000 servants went with the army to serve the army, to cook for the army. They had entertainment, they had dancing, they had singing, they had women, they had all kinds of... There were people that were in charge just to take alcohol with the army. I mean, this was ajib. And we see it today as with kuffar as well. You have all these I mean, entertainment and all this stuff, you know, who's going to set up the network for them to go look at stuff they shouldn't be looking at, I guess. Um, so... With these 80,000, now that's, that's not including the 240, 240 are fighters. 80,000 are there to serve logistics. And then they had 33 elephants. Now, when you talk about elephants, you need to understand. It's not like the elephant you see in the zoo kind of waving at you. These are elephants that were taken as babies and tortured and, and raised with nothing but hate and raised to fight. 
and they were very vicious. They only knew battle. So when they were let loose on an army, it was not just directing them, they would themselves be attacking. And they would have bells tied to them. And they would have large yani metal objects tied, so when he would move its trunk, it would kill people. And these were huge elephants. So this was like a super weapon of the time. And the Arabs did not know how to fight against elephants. As we saw in the Battle of the Bridge that we discussed in the earlier dars. This was a very difficult thing for the Muslims because they had never faced such an enemy. And an elephant was also very difficult to fight because it wasn't just the elephant. They had people sitting on top, groups of people. That's how large these elephants were. And they would be archers. And they would be shooting arrows at you and you couldn't get to them. So it's like today when you see like uh, the cowardly way of taking a drone or a plane and just dropping it. It's not a, a man-to-man fighting. And he, how are you going to shoot back at a drone? You know, how are you going to fight fist to fist or hand to hand with a drone? Right? How come nobody calls that cowardly? Or if you just take a, Israel sends a little plane and drops bombs on a block of people, and they call that brave soldiers, mashallah. So these elephants were also where you couldn't get to the fighters. Then, as the Qutb of Tariq have mentioned, another 200,000. Farmers and villagers were told that they would have to help in case of need. These were regular people who were not drafted, but they were put on standby. So the, the Persians realized this was a great battle. And this was initiated by the Persians. Yani there were battles between the Muslims and the Persians, but this battle began with the Persians making an intention to take this army and perform a genocide, wipe out, kill, massacre the Muslims in Medina. Their point was to go to Medina. And that's why Umar ibn Khattab himself had set out until, as we discussed, Abdurrahman bin Auf and other Sahaba, they told, they advised him to stay, and they sent uh, Sa'd ibn Waqas anhu in his place. Tayyib. Now, when we look at this battle, it's very important to understand a few things. Why was this battle being fought? And what was the intention behind it? Rustam and others, they were asked about this. I mean, there is historic documentation. And I'll talk about one thing as kind of a spoiler, but Rustam will be captured. And he will himself, and this is recorded in Ahadith. Yani the words of Rustam were heard by some of the Sahaba and Tabi'un, and they recorded them. In with Sanad, with the chains of narrators. And they were recorded in the books of Hadith. So we can check the authenticity and write. And one of the things that Rustam said is that he said, we knew we were going to lose. So they asked Rustam, why did you fight? He said, fame, yani pride, and the love for leadership. And these are two things we should be very careful that this doesn't yani, uh, get to us. If we look at the other side of the coin, yani why was Rustam fighting? From his own words, for leadership, for power, for fame, for name, for money, for wealth, for these things. But when we look at the Muslim advance and their defense, what was the intention? Here we go back to the conversation between Rabi' ibn Amir radiallahu anhu and Rustam he stated clearly the Muslim intention. Was it to conquer Persia? No. Was it because Persia had great wealth and, and, and resources, they wanted to control world domination, new world order? No. Was it because they wanted to yani, have some kind of a racial problem between Arabs and Persians? No. In fact, Rabi' ibn Amir, radiallahu anhu, he told him, yani, why they came to fight? Ikhrajul ibad, min ibadat al-ibad ila ibadat Allah to take out the ibad, the slaves of Allah, from the ibadah, from the servitude or worship of the ibad, of the slaves of Allah, to the worship and servitude of Allah. And this is a very important thing. Muslims don't fight for land. Muslims don't fight for wealth. Muslims don't fight for fame, for worldly gain. When a Muslim fights, or at least that's how it should be. It should be only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
you should not fight for nationalism. And I'm making this point because it's very important. Today we see in most of the Muslim lands, when there is a fight, it's about country. And if we want Palestine for the Palestinians, well, good luck with that. What do you want from us then? And it's something ajib. If we look at even uh, the oppressive apartheid of Israel, yes, I'm not afraid to speak about Israel still. If we look at the oppressive illegal state of Israel, at least they have made it a homeland for all Jews. And if you're Jewish, even if you can track a faraway ancestry, or even if you fake it, they will accept you, you will go there, you will become a citizen of Israel. I mean, I'm not saying you'll be equal, because I've been to occupied Palestine, today called Israel. And the Ethiopian Jews are not treated like the European Jews. In fact, the original Jews of the land, which is Palestine, are oppressed by the European Jews. And then Yahoo and Sharon, they're not from there. These are all guys that came from Russia and Germany and things. And this is why it's an oppressive state even to Jews. But at least they say, you know what? If you're Jewish, you can come live here. Tell you, can I move to Palestine? <laughs> How much do I have to bribe which official to just get there? <laughs> they, don't, they don't say it's land for the Muslims. Yani if you're from Burma, come, welcome, you can live in Palestine. This land for Islam? No. For Palestinian rights. Well, see how well that's working out for you. If you look at nationalism, everywhere, every country, our qawm, it is a part of iman to love your nation. Where is that hadith? Yeah, maudu hadith have fabrications. To love your homeland from iman? So if your homeland is a land of kufr, you're going to love it over the land of tawheed? Show us a sanad. And you don't make up things on your own. Nationalism is never a part of Islam. Any hadith that's nationalistic, go look at the Sanad, it will be a fabrication. Nationalism, we don't care about Somalia or Ethiopia or Eritrea or Pakistan or Afghanistan or this stand or that stand or this uh, republic. We don't care about any of that. Islam teaches us we are one ummah. You're black, you're white, you're Chinese, you're, you're, you're whatever, you're mixed, whatever, you're one ummah. Does not matter about national. We don't fight for nationalism. We don't stand up for nationalism. We don't celebrate nationalism. We don't get excited over nationalism. We are one ummah. Yes, we are from different lands, and we recognize that, and we respect that, and we are from different qaba'il, different tribes, and we respect that, and we should know where we're from, and who's for what, as the Sahaba radiallahu anhum did. But we don't fight for that. We don't stand up for that. We don't unite behind that. We unite behind La ilaha illallah, huh? Muhammadur Rasulullah. And this is what the Sahaba told them. Look, look, we don't want your land. We don't want your wealth. You become a Muslim, keep your land. Keep Persia for the Persians, whatever. Rule your land. Keep your kingdom. Keep your wealth. Keep everything. Just accept Tawheed. Accept the message of Allah. Sent to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you keep it. We don't want a dime from you. Nothing. Tell you, but we're not going to force it on you. We're not going. They didn't go to make the Persians Muslim because you can't force Islam on anybody. You can't force anybody to become Muslim. This is a, 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 a misconception that the kuffar have tried to propagate. And in the tariq of Islam, nobody's ever been forced to become Muslim. Why? Because how can you force somebody to become Muslim? If I put a gun to your head and you say the shahada, does that count? No. The shahada starts with the heart. It expresses with the tongue. It is felt through your, your actions. So how can you bring that at force? No. The people that become Muslim, it has to be from their own willingness. Tayyib. If not... We're not going to force you to become Muslim. Keep your religion. You want to keep your religion? We're not going to force you. But we're also not going to allow you to oppress people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this earth to be free. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this earth for people to have freedom. What does freedom mean? Yani freedom for you to live without oppression. Freedom for you to live yani, without uh, this, this oppression of being forced to live in a way of kufr. 
I'll give you an example. When we talk about religious freedom, in Islam, we have religious freedom. Even Ahlul Dhimma, even the people who are not Muslim, living under Muslim rule, have more freedoms than minority religions in America. And I'm ready to debate this on Fox, if they invite me. Or on talk radio, Roger Hedgecock, or whatever that druggie, this other druggie guy. I forgot his name. Anybody. Sean, Comedy, Hannity, whatever. We're ready. Invite us. We'll bring proofs. We'll discuss it. How? Under Islam, read the book called Ahkam Ahlul Dhimma by Ibn al-Qayyim al jawzi Under Islamic Sharia, people who are Christians and Jews, they are able to practice their own religious law as long as it doesn't conflict with criminal law. Meaning, you can't say, I killed somebody, but there's nothing on me because in my religion, uh, you can kill people, right? So, you can't say that. But, you can, for example, in issues of divorce, in issues of marriage, in issues of inheritance, use your own laws. Yani, if your religion allows you to marry 20, 30, 40 women like Mormons, or more, whatever, that's your religion. We're not going to force Islamic ideas on you. Under Islamic law, tayyib. Even a Mormon cannot openly, except in Utah, where they have clout, they cannot marry more than one wife in America. Why? It's a part of the religion. But no, America says no, it's not acceptable. It's not criminal law, but they say no. Hey? Many religious burial services are banned in the U.S. Like, I yani need the full way of sati, the Hindus, they burn their families or whatever. They can cremate, but the full burning as it's supposed to be done, are not, they're not allowed to do it. Many Islamic practices, like how the talaq is done, how inheritance is divided, is not allowed in U.S. law. And unless you put it in your uh, will of inheritance, the government will take it, and they will do it the way they want to. Right? The way of divorce in Islam is different, but they don't accept it in the U.S. So that means under Islam, you have more freedom. So if they don't become Muslim, they have a second option. Keep your religion, but enforce the peace the justice of Islam in your land, allow us to do da'wah, don't stop us from calling people towards Tawheed, and you can keep your land. If not, then it's a fight. So this was the intention behind the two armies, and that's very important to understand. Tayyib, when we look at the preparation, who was leading from the side of the Persians, and who was leading from the side of the Muslims? From the side of the Persians, the lead commander, the main guy, and we discussed the politics behind it in the last verse, I'm not going to go over that again, was Rustum. And Rustum was a fierce enemy of Islam. So if you have kids, please don't name them Rustum. It's just, isn't there any Nabi you can name your children after? Sahaba, Abdullah, Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahim, beautiful names uh, with Abd of Allah. And why can you name your children after like some kafir that hated Muslims? Rustam, he is the leader of the army. But with him, the Persians had sent their top generals. They had gone out and found the best warriors, some of whom were, weren't a part of the Persian army. They were hired as experts in battle, and they were put with Rustam for the battle, including Bahman, Hormuzan, uh, Jalinus, uh, Shahriyar, Firoz, uh, Khandakbak, Gergur, uh, Tiruvi, Mushegeh, yeah. bunch of others that Jawan Sher, uh, Nakhrigan, I don't know what the names mean, I'm probably butchering them, but this is the way it is in the historic books. These were all leaders under Rustam. From the Muslim side, Umar ibn Khattab who put Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. We know him that he was from the ten that were given the glad tidings of Jannah. We know that he was the first one to shoot an arrow fi sabilillah. We know he was from who was called the Khal of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We discussed that already. But one of the things that Imam Ibn Kathir mentions in Bidawa Nihayat that one of the reasons he was appointed 
as the Amir of the Muslim army is, he was somebody whose dua was accepted. In Al-Isaba, Al Al the Tamiyiz al-Sahaba, Ibn Hajar al-Sqalani, when he discusses Sa'ad ibn Waqas, radiyanhu, he mentions many ahadith to show that when he made dua, it was accepted. Tayyib, but why? Yani what was the sabab? All of us want our dua to be accepted. Nobody here says, I want to make dua, but I don't really want it. Yani everybody wants that I raise my hands and dua is accepted. One of my own teachers, Sheikh Abu Muhammad, he discusses the historic documentation on why and what the ulema said. And I will summarize in two things. Two things, why? So we can bring this into our life. If you want your dua to be accepted, bring these two sifatan, these two sifat into your life. First, Sa'ad radiallahu anhu was always truthful. He was a man who always spoke the truth. So if you want your dua to be accepted, the first thing, be truthful. Second, he was very careful about halal and haram. And he, what he ate, how he earned, how he dealt with people, how he did business, how he dealt with amana. He was very careful about halal and haram. Today, this is a big problem in our ummah. First, yani unfortunately, in our ummah, as in ummah, I'm not talking about San Diego or the brothers here or sisters, but as an ummah, truthfulness is gone. <laughs> Try doing business in any Muslim country. You go to any market, they'll be like, I'm selling this at a, at a loss. Why would you sell at a loss? How are you going to make money? Don't sell at a loss. No, no, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, you're not really selling at a loss, are you? <laughs> Why are you going to lie? And you can just be truthful. I bought it for this much, I'm selling for this much. You want to buy it, buy it. You don't want to buy it, don't buy it. Be truthful. No, no, wallahi billah. Why are you taking qasam? I mean, you're selling a, a spoon or something. You're taking qasam. Qasam is something valuable in front of us. And then you're going to lie about it. How are you going to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment? And Allah will ask you, you took qasam in my name and you knew you were lying. How are you going to answer that? Sad. Halal and haram. Today, everybody has a fatwa to make haram halal. You want to go to Burger King, there's a fatwa. You want to go to KFC, there's a fatwa. You want to go buy a house in Riba, there's a fatwa. You want to steal and rob, there's a fatwa. You want to drink alcohol, there's a fatwa. You want to perform 10 minute nikah, there's a fatwa. Everything you can get a fatwa. Do you think that fatwa will make haram halal for you? If it was so easy, then trust me, I can Google and find fatwa for anything. I mean, every example that I just gave, there are fatawa for. I didn't just make that list up, unfortunately. Okay? You want to smoke weed? I'll find you a fatwa. But it'll still be halal. And you'll still be held accountable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doesn't make it halal. I don't care if it's legal. Doesn't make it halal. In front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran, the Sahih Ahadith, this is all you can accept. With him was Al-Muthanna ibn Haratha radiallahu anhu and we spoke about his bravery and his taqwa and what a great sahabi he was. With them was Al-Ka'ka' ibn Amr al-Tamimi. Al-Ka'ka' 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 radiallahu anhu. He was the one that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu said about him that if he's in an army, it cannot be defeated. And they said about him that Al-Qa'qa' radiallahu anhu, if his voice is heard in an army, it is more beneficial than a thousand soldiers. These are both mawquf ahadith from Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, as Ibn Kathir mentions. And also with him is Al-Asim, Ibn Amr al-Tamimi, which is his brother. So this is the leadership of the Muslim army. On the way to the battle, Al-Muthanna Ibn Haratha, radiallahu anhu, he became sick. Al-Muthanna radiallahu had been sent by Umar, radiallahu anhu, to prepare the people beginning, to, be, to prepare them. And as he was going through the different towns, to encourage the Muslims to fight, 
And it was a difficult time because we think it's just like you get out of your house and the next thing you're in a battlefield. That's not how it is. I need to prepare an army and to encourage them and to mobilize them and to move them and to go to the different towns and give khutub, give talks and encourage people to fight and prepare. It takes a lot of work and it's hard because you're always traveling, going to different areas, getting sick, going through hardships with yani, danger. So from that hardship, Al-Muthanna radiallahu anhu became sick and he was on his deathbed. He was going to die. So at that time, he started to give nasiha to his people. And I will give just three points from his advice. It's long, but for the sake of time, I'm going to shorten it. One, he said that the first thing that you should stick to is the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Taqwa. Always stick to a taqwa. Second, he said, don't fight the enemy in the middle. Because he had been in fights with the Persians, he knew their tactics. He said, don't try to go to the middle of the army, fight from the sides. Their numbers are more, and if you get into a fight in the middle, they will try to yani, overwhelm you. So go from the sides. And fight in a way that you have an open desert behind you, and they don't. Because if not, they will run. And as they run, because they fear death, you will chase them and they will try to entrap you. They will try to ambush you. And then he gave a nasiha, which is something ajib. He had a wife, her name was Salma. And she was known to be a very brave woman and a very intelligent woman. And a woman who knew battles well. And she was a woman, but she went with her husband for battle. And she knew strategies in battle. And even though he loved his wife, but he said, if I die, my nasiha is that if she's going to remarry, that she doesn't marry anybody except the Amir of the Jais assigned by Umar. Radiallahu anhu. Something ajeeb. Today, most people would be like, no, don't marry anybody else. But the Sahaba, they had, they had that love for the religion. He said, look, if I'm dead, maybe she will need to marry, if she wants to. And instead of just marrying somebody else, I'd rather that intelligence, that strategy in war, that experience go to help the Muslim Ummah. And I think about how much they loved the religion, how focused were they, that even in this type of a time, he gave such a beautiful nasiha, and this happened. She married Sa'ad ibn Waqas radiallahu anhu. Tayyib. When we look at the people that were sent, the Muslim army, as we had mentioned before, was about 30,000. And they were facing an army of 240,000 plus. And Khalid ibn al-Walid is not with them. And in the earlier durus, we always talk about Khalid and Khalid and Khalid radiallahu anhu. But here he's not with them. He stays behind by the request of Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah to help in the battles against the Romans, to stabilize Sham. Abu Ubaidah sent who he could from Sham and the Muslims, they spent six months in preparation of this battle. And he, think about this. It's not like they just went and the fight began. No, six months of travel, six months of hardships, six months of preparation, six months of moving, six months of encouragement. I mean, even if you go out right now, and to spend just the six months in that type of travel, I'm afraid that me before you would all get tired and yeah, I'm going home and forget all this. Where's my nice bed? You know, I'm missing this Netflix. <laughs> What's going to happen in Game of, well, Game of Thrones? I've never seen it actually. Yeah. Subhanallah. I mean, just six months of continuous travel and hardship and being away from the family is hard enough. But that was just a preparation. Here, Rustam, when he saw the Muslim army advancing, and this at Tabari and uh, Ibn Sa'ad and Ibn Kathir have recorded, from his own admission, he sent a spy to go spy on the Muslims. Rustam, when he saw the Muslim army coming, he sent a spy. And this spy came to the Muslims and said that I am defecting from the Persians, and I'm becoming a Muslim. But he was a spy. He was not a Muslim. He pretended. And he went with the Muslim army. And he started to 
Look at how the Muslims live. And then he went back after a couple of days and he went back and he gave his news to his boss, Rustum. Rustum asked, how were they? He said, what I saw from them is if anything is known to be an order from their Lord, yani Allah, they never leave it. SubhanAllah. Now imagine, you go to any Muslim army today, any Muslim, I'm not picking on any country, pick an army. And you send a spy to go live amongst the soldiers. And you come back and you ask them, how were they? I wonder what they would say. But he said, the first thing, if there was anything that was the order of Allah, they wouldn't leave it. And if they saw anything to be from their Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would not leave it. SubhanAllah. And he said, I saw them praying in the nights, and I saw them fasting in the daytime. Praying in the nights and fasting in the daytime. He asked, Rustam asked, if they pray in the night and they fast in the day, what do they eat? What is there? Because again, the Persians were very really lavish. They had professional cooks and huge, I mean, 80,000 people just to serve the army. So he said, how is their life? What do they eat? He said, I didn't see them eating. And I saw them, but I didn't see them eating, except I saw these sticks that they were putting in their mouth, and maybe this is what they eat. What is the stick in the mouth? A siwak. Al miswak, masawik. This is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi And this is something, unfortunately, we have lost today. Even though we know Rasul alayhi salatu salam, he told us that if it wasn't for the fact that I was afraid there would be a hardship on my ummah, I would have ordered them with the siwak, with every wudu, another rawaya for every salah. And every time you perform wudu, it would have been wajib. But Rasul alayhi salatu salam, out of a mercy not to make a hardship, didn't order us. And every salah. And he, this is something that even Rasul sallam, when he would wake up in the night, Aisha Taradiyan said that she would have water and a siwak waiting for him. There are battles that we'll discuss later that were won because of the siwak. And this was a hallmark of the Sahaba radiyallahu Yes, you have a toothbrush, maybe you've got a nice electric toothbrush and an infrared cleaning blue light toothbrush, great. But still, the siwak of Rasul alayhi salatu salam is still something special. Here, Rustam, he discussed with his people and hearing about the army that he was facing, he decided to surrender. Rustam said, we can't fight these people. Our army is big, but they're drunk, they're partying, they're scared. These guys, they're fasting in the day, praying at night. They don't eat, their bodies are big, but they don't eat. They're not, yani, we're fighting people that, are, that, that have a dedication we can't win from. So let's surrender. But his people, they got upset. They said, what are you talking about? These are Arabs, they're Arabs are fools, and Arabs are idiots. And yani, the Persians had a very low opinion of Arabs. And they said, you know, these guys can't fight, and we're a superpower, we're this, we're that, we're this. And many other uh, great nations of the past said similar things about certain countries who are now known as the graveyards of, or of superpowers. I'm not going to mention names, but you can read the works of Churchill or Russians or... What's that general? General Peter? Oh, yeah. So, many people, they make these statements, but you should realize what you're getting into. Rustam realized it. But now his army is like, no, we got to go forward. So they went forward. The battle of Qadisiyah was fought over four days. It's not like a battle that began in the evening, you're done. And the battle continued to the middle of the night. I mean, they would have, it would begin in the morning and they would fight until the middle of the night. The battle began with an attack from the Persian side. And this attack was not a full-on attack. It was a very cowardly attack. Why? They didn't attack the Muslim army. They didn't attack yani, the barracks of the Muslims. But Sa'ad ibn Baqas radiallahu anhu had set up a house for himself in the, middle, in the middle of the battlefield. And it's something very brave. But Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, unfortunately, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had some tests. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests the Muslims. He got a severe nerve pain that started yani, in his body towards the, the bottom and it went all the way to his head. And this was something that paralyzed him. He, had, he couldn't move. And he had sores and, 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 and pimples with pus that had developed on his body from the hardships of travel. So he couldn't ride on a horse or a camel or even sit. And imagine the hardship he's in. Anybody here would have been excused not to go forward in the battle. And he, he, he's, he's paralyzed, he can't move, he can't sit, he can't ride, he can't physically go fight. He could, have, he could have said, you know, somebody else take charge, I'm going back. But he didn't. Sa'ad ibn Waqqas radiyanhu, he went forward. And he put his residence in the middle of the battlefield. And he had with him his wives and many others with him. But this was a place to live. This wasn't a, a battle, I mean, this wasn't a barrack with soldiers. But the Persian decided to attack him. Why? Because they said, if we can disrespect the women of the Muslims, maybe they can become afraid and they'll go back. And it's a very lowly strategy. But that's what they did. And they attacked the house of Sa'ad ibn Waqqas radiallahu anhu. And here Salma, the wife of Muthanna ibn Haratha, ex-wife, because he's become a shaheed. He died, fi sabilillah. Even if it wasn't during a battle, he's still a shaheed. Now she's married to Sa'ad ibn Waqqas radiallahu anhu. She saw the attack and it was an overwhelming attack. And the Muslims were few, and she started to call out for her old husband. And yeah, I wish Muthanna was here because he was so brave. Sa'd ibn Waqqas became upset, and he slapped her on the face. Now we know in the Sharia, Rasulullah sallallahu has forbidden slapping on the face. We know this. The ahadith are there, and this should not be done. But I mean, there are times of anger a person loses control. And Sa'd radiyan, he told her, like, look, you see my condition. Yani, the reason that I'm not going myself. But don't call out to anybody who's dead. And don't call out to anybody. Don't think anybody else dead could help us. This is what it is. And here, even though Sa'ad, Radiyan, who was paralyzed, he got up and he tried to fight himself. And he instructed the Muslims on how to fight. And the first scrimmage that happened was overwhelming from the Persian side. They had an elite unit that attacked. And the house was only guarded by a few Sahaba. And Alhamdulillah, as the Kutub of Tariq have mentioned, but the Asanid are not there. These are just narrations that the Muslims, they shot arrows until the enemy was close enough and cut through them with swords. And in a very brave manner, they repelled the attack. The surprise attack was repelled and the Persians went back. Now, Sa'ad Radiyanhu decided that we're going to now full on attack. But not the houses of the Persians, we're going to attack men, like men. So here, he set up the army. In the army, there is the Muqaddamatul Jaysh, which is the head. These are the, yani the bravest and the, and the diehard, the ones that are going to take on the, the, the enemy on the first and, and pierce into the heart. Here, uh, Zuhra uh, ibn Hawiya uh, Tamimi radiallahu anhu was made the Amir of the army there. Amir of this unit. And this was the head of the army. Then there is the right wing of the army. And here is Abdullah ibn Mu'tim. Radiallahu anhu, we spoke about him before as well, great yani, warrior of Islam. He is in charge of the right side. The left wing is Shurahbil ibn Hasana, radiallahu anhu. We spoke about him many a times. Great warrior Shurahbil, radiallahu anhu, he's in charge of the left side. The cavalry, the ones that are on horses, the Fursan, the one who is riders, Asim ibn Amr al Tamimi, the brother of Qaqa, radiallahu anhu, he is made in charge of the ones that are on horses. Ammal ibn Malik, he is made the in charge of the infantry, the people that are on foot. Uh, Ziyad ibn Abi Sufyan, radiallahu anhu, he is the one who recorded the battle for the Muslims. If you look at, he was the official scribe. And that's why much of the battle was written down. And the Kutub of Tariq, many of them they say that the Rawi of the Hadith, he said, I looked at the writing of Ziyad, and then I saw what happened, and this is what happened. So the Asanid for the battle have been recorded in two ways. One, from the writing records itself. And then from the Sahaba that were there, that narrated the battle themselves. And Salman al-Farasi, radiallahu anhu, was the da'i of the army. 
they didn't have dancers and, and entertainment and what the USO, what is that? You know, they go and comedians and stuff. No. But they had a da'i. He would go to the different barracks and he would call them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he would teach them fiqh. And he would teach them hadith. And he would teach them Quran. And he would, he would remind them about the akhirah and about the fadail of jihad and things. He was Salman al-Farasi radiyanhu was there. And now notice something. Where is Salman al-Farasi from? Faras. Who is he fighting? The people of Faras. Is he saying, forget the Arabs. I got to stick with my people. I'm Persian. That's my people. No. He's a Muslim. Now he's a Muslim. Islam is his identity. That's his ethnicity. That's his people. Muslims. He is encouraging. He is leading the charge to fight his own people. Because the battle is between Islam and Kufr. It's not about Arab and Persian. Salman al-Farasi radiyanhu is the da'i. Now, when the battle began, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiyanhu, who's in a lot of pain, and he's very sick, he got up, even though he wasn't able to stand. He got up, and he recited ayat of Qur'an, and a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and encouraged his army Telling them that, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised this earth for the salihin, for the pious. So make yourself from the salihin and Allah will give you victory. Make yourself from the salihin and Allah will give you victory. And he said, I will recite four takbirat. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. At the first takbir, begin to prepare your ranks. At the second takbir, be prepared with your weapons to attack. At the third takbir, arrange yourself. At the fourth takbir, attack the enemy. Why takbirat? This is something that puts fear in the hearts of kuffar. So four takbirat, and this was the style of Sahaba, radiallahu anhum. And he encouraged his army to recite, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. This dhikr has a lot of power. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There are many a hadith about the fadail of la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And how it helps a person. And how it brings nusra. And how it can take you out of hardships. But I will just tell you one hadith. That sahih hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that this is kanz min kunuz. It is a treasure from the treasures تحت الأرش يعني from underneath from underneath the arsh of Allah سبحانه وتعالى it is a treasure this ذكر لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله is a treasure from the treasures from underneath the arsh of Allah سبحانه وتعالى so imagine what is the value of this رستم he saw the Muslim advance and he took his army and they started to advance and there was time for salah and he heard the adhan and when he heard the adhan he retreated. People told him, why? He said, don't you hear that that is them calling to war? The spy that had gone had said, no, 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 that's not a call to war. This is something five, days, five times a day, they call this out so that they can pray. When Rustam heard the adhan, he told a translator to translate it for him. They translated the meanings. He said something, he said it, not me. He said, this is Umar speaking, teaching the kilab, the dogs of the Arab, aql, and intelligence. And Rustum, he hated the Arabs, so he called them dogs. But he thought it was Umar himself. <laughs> and he said, the wording was so beautiful to him. He said, this is Umar teaching even the worst, and the kilab of the Arab, he's teaching them aql, intelligence. We need to go back. We can't fight these people. But once again, his generals, the others, they said, how can we go back? This is a final battle. If we lose this battle, the Persian Empire is over. So they went forward. And inshallah, next Saturday, we'll discuss the full-on attack. Jazakumullahu khairan.